pound for pound opera has more or less remained the most expensive live art form out there besides disney on ice besides but, disney on ice but that's got a corporation footing the bill <laughs> <laughs> on the dallas opera network you're listening to opera box score uh, let's get ready to rumble wherever you are however you're listening it's America's talk radio show about opera. This is Opera Box Score. I'm George Cedarquist, joined by Oliver Camacho, Matt Cummings, Weston Williams, and Ashley Hardgrave. All right, this week, as you can imagine, there's really only one thing on our collective minds right now. And to give you some relief from the horrific news coming out of Ukraine, we'll take the majority of this episode to talk about politics and opera, because those two things go together like peanuts and Cracker Jacks. But first, we have to address the soprano in the room. That's right. The war apologist slash cookbook author slash wannabe dictator lover slash soprano. And that big old foot she stuck in her mouth yet again, plus two minute drill. Actually, you know what? Let's give the drill a week off so it can join the protests. Hey, if you're watching on TDO, make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Get that full show, Stitcher, Spotify, click follow, Apple Podcasts. You just hit the plus sign. You too can send us that voice memo. Email us, fathottakeoperaboxscoregmail.com. Get that merch, OBS Beer Coaster, OBS The Pelpin, just for sharing your hot take. Oliver Camacho, there you are. Here I am. Yes, it's uh, it's tough times. and. Um... I don't know what to say right now. So I just, uh, why don't you go on to the next person? <laughs> that would be Matt Cummings. He is on the show, but he's not in the opening lineup. So that makes uh, Weston Williams next. Oh, cool. I get to lighten the mood. Hi, uh, <laughs> I, I'm here in my bunker. I'm fine so far. Uh, and hopefully we all will be soon. But I do want to say that uh, for this particular show, obviously we are not qualified to talk about much about the political situation going on right now, and the situation is changing so rapidly that uh, all of our information is going to be out of date by the time this episode goes out <laughs> anyway. So uh, hello from a few days ago. If you're seeing this and everything's fine now, that's great. If not, not it's over. Good, yay. <laughs> Putin uh, but, gave up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we are qualified. We... Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Ashley. Hardgrave. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that cracking jokes about Russian kidnapping just six weeks ago was going to land us here, but uh, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Sorry, guys. You did Didn't well. Didn't realize that was going to happen. You did well, kid. I'll, I'll lighten the mood. So I started playing in a, uh, a pickup ice hockey league this morning. Oh. I've, I've, I'm a pretty good skater. I've, you know, I play a little bit of hockey, and um, so I'm in a pickup hockey league now, first time out, with a whole bunch of guys who are way bigger and way faster than me. And can I just say that, like... But you've got that hair. They they, they think you're taller <laughs> I do have the, the David hair, Lynch so. hair, but <laughs> right now, like, my thighs and calves are absolutely on oh, fire. Oh, we're talking about your thighs. Thighs and calves all <laughs> I am just like burning. If this was the 18th century, <laughs> who boy, I'd be fainting right now. He's literally swole. George I'm, is swole right now from the I waist down. I am burning from the waist down right now. <laughs> Let's you know, talk some. It's... <laughs> I'm sorry. I was afraid to let it land on. A... I'm burning from the waist down right now. Um, I will say, though, since we are just on the uh, other side of the Winter Olympics, it's really amazing to me how many cold weather sports are so reliant on legs and leg power. You think about speed skating, you think about hockey, also curling. The one time that I was given mm -hmm. a curling lesson and I learned to throw the stone, I can walk for like two days afterwards because my legs were so sore. Let's all walk over to Opera Land and talk some opera. So as always, we are recording on Monday. Uh, it's about 7.30 p.m. in Chicago. It's February 28th. Uh, a lot of stuff has gone down um, and a lot of stuff will continue to go down and we don't know what the situation will be when you hear this episode. But we can talk about some of the definite things that have happened in our community, uh, namely opera companies like Teatro dell'Opera di Roma and the Bayerische Staatsoper and Finnish National Opera all expressing their solidarity with Ukraine, mm -hmm. with uh, Putin friend Conductor Valery Gergiev losing all of his jobs and even his all of uh, them, yeah, even his agents saying, "You know what? <laughs> yeah. Find, an, find so, another yeah. manager." You know, literally like all of his yeah. jobs. 
The, the, and, Met, ha- the Met has uh, also gotten rid of every pro, uh, obviously pro Putin artist on their roster for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and is, their uh, Lohengrin has, had the Bolshoi in it, so they're going to yeah, have to scrap yeah. that production, the one that was supposed to be planned for next season. And of course, and they're going to have to build their sets themselves now. Yeah, uh, of course, there's the Anna Trepko issue, and uh, she and her husband, you see, I forget his last name. Uh, we're going to give a recital and there were protests. So they canceled the recital and they made like a, n- a nothing burger statement. And then <laughs> Anna Dutrepko felt even more pressure to like say something personal about how she feels about all this. And she, she didn't feel pressure. She just wanted to yeah. hear herself talk. <laughs> and she basically said, I don't like war, but I'm not a politician. And, you know, a musician shouldn't be forced to like be political, you know. So she didn't really step away from her position. She just said she doesn't like war, you know. So we got a really fantastic response to that by the brilliant social media maven and amazing pianist Igor Lovett. He said, being a musician does not free you from being a citizen, from taking responsibility, from being a grown up, remaining vague when one man, especially the man who is the leader of your home country, starts a war against another country and by doing so also causes greatest suffering to your home country and your people is unacceptable. P.S. Never never bring up music and your being a musician as an excuse do not insult art thank you igor levitt yeah look yeah, i don't i mean I don't... the challenge for me on this is well and i before we get too in the weeds i think it's terribly important to put a line of demarcation between russians and pro putinists because i think those are two different populations of people oh, absolutely. Uh, there's there's a lot of talk around about you know don't have russian this and expel russian students no no that's that doesn't help anyone um but folks that have been vocally in support over the last i don't know decade of someone who is now currently an active war criminal i think that's a whole other thing altogether and i <sighs> It's it's no secret how I feel about Anna Netrebko, and it would be incredibly easy for me to do like a stereotypically angry Ashley rant right about here. Um, but I'm Trademarked. real tired, yes, and <laughs> and can't. And the one and a half spoons I have left, I won't spend on yelling about her. But I will say that there is a difference between saying that you don't want war, which basically everybody except one person on the planet can say with confidence, and being absolutely vocally in support of the one person on this planet who actually does, in fact, want war. And there are receipts. Uh, 2011 Newsweek article when you address the idea of being his lover and you said that you would have loved to have been because he has such a strong male energy. Or in 2012 when you were on the list of 499 trusted people of Vladimir who were officially authorized to campaign for him in his presidential election. Uh, and most certainly not in 2014 right after the invasion of Crimea when you gave a check of 1 million rubles to an opera house in Donetsk in the care of a pro-Kremlin separatist leader, which, by the way, you were photographed with him holding a separatist flag. So there's a difference in being that political for a decade and then posting a now disappeared Instagram story that says you don't think that it's fair that musicians get are forced to be called political. It didn't bother you a decade ago. It didn't bother you 10 minutes ago. I'm not really sure why it bothers you now. I mean, look, here's the thing, right? all theater is political, right? That's like the first thing you learn in theater school. So I don't know why Anna Netrebko thinks that she's not in the politics biz, right? All yeah. theater is political, whether you like it or not. Especially in more. Russia, <laughs> you absolutely, know? Absolutely. It's like the birthplace of political theater, you know? Furthermore, like, this is your chance. This is actually your chance, right? right? And I, I also want to, like, point out, like, there are, like, I will say, I do understand it is difficult in Russia to be outwardly, outspokenly Absolutely. anti-Putin. Um, but I, and I want to highlight that there is uh, there is a lot of very brave people going around right now. Uh, there's a, actually a petition against the war sung, uh, signed by several um, institutions and general directors, including the Bolshoi general director of, uh, of Vladimir Urin and the conductor and violinist Vladimir Sp- uh, Spivakov. Um, they uh, are circulating a petition among Russian cultural institutions uh, saying uh, that, quote, we now speak not only as cultural figures, but as ordinary people, citizens of our country. 
Uh, among us are the children and grandchildren of those who fought in the Great Patriotic War. That's what they call World War II. Uh, witnesses and participants of that war. Um, we call for the preservation of the highest value, human life, um, going against uh, Putin in the war, um, which is extraordinarily brave. And I wouldn't ask that of every single person uh, in Russia to be that outspoken and obvious. But um, I do want to point out that and applaud the heroism of people uh, calling that out in this way. Chalk Talk on Opera Box Score. It has been a slow week, slow month in the opera news world and in no other <laughs> no other field of news. Um, uh, I will say this is this was an idea we had for uh, a while. It was actually an idea we had for President's Day, but for various reasons it didn't end up happening. We wanted to examine the role of uh, political leaders in opera, and um, we are not qualified to comment on certain political situations happening abroad at the moment. Um, but Nor do thought... you really want to know what our takes are. <laughs> <laughs> Too spicy. Um, but I do think that this is a, a great opportunity to explore the relationship between opera and political power. And it's always had this interesting relationship from the very, very beginning, all the way back to the 1600s. Uh, where you have the first operas being produced by wealthy patrons. You think of Monteverdi's L'Orfeo, you know, uh, being paid for um, by, a, a, you know, a nobility. Duke. Yeah. A duke. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, because pound for pound, opera has more or less remained the most expensive live art form out there. Um, besides Disney on Ice. Besides but, Disney on Ice. But that's got a corporation <laughs> footing the bill. <laughs> um, pound for pound, opera is so expensive that there's always been this tension between the people who can afford the opera and those who want to criticize it or influence it in some way. Um, think which of makes, for... which makes actually, which makes the opera we're going to first talk about even more interesting because it represents a shift from operas being performed in the court to being performed in the theater and what mm -hmm. audiences are willing mm -hmm. to pay for. But go on. I, I digress yeah. from you. I think it, it's an absolutely valid point because, you know, think of like uh, operas during the court of Louis Fourteenth, for example, where... They're all kissing his butt. <laughs> the entire time to the yeah. point where Louis Fourteenth only allows Lully to, uh, to compose operas. Yeah. And you even think of even like the classical era, you know, you, you think of like all of these uh, operas written by like Mozart and Salieri, where they'll have a little part at the end that sings the moral. And it's always about how, how powerful people should treat people nicely. Hint, 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 please. It's a, uh, please it's pay a me. It's a aggressive take to politics. <laughs> <laughs> but if at the only same our time, leaders were enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> if only um and then uh and you also have you know uh just just like a lot of like uh, a lot of a lot of trying to make sure that kings and rulers and nobility are put in a good light when they're written for those people i want to first talk about uh an opera one of the first operas not one of the first operas but one of the early operas in the renaissance uh late renaissance that uh, let's, really we can, we can call it Early Baroque. Early Baroque, late yeah, Renaissance. Yeah. No, it's not. Call it. Monteverdi is is the end of the Renaissance, the beginning of the Baroque. But by the time we get to Popea, we're like at 1643. So. Yeah, he's, a, he's an old man. Yeah. yeah, he is an old man. This is the last opera. Uh, and this We are talking about the uh, Incoronazione di Popea, uh, the uh, coronation of Popea. Uh, and this was written for a public audience, as far as we know, in Venice. Uh, Venice had, of course, the first opera houses that were available to the public, and also the first time where you start to see operas not being written exclusively for wealthy elites. That's for several reasons. Part of it is because of Venice's unique history and political structure, which is really unlike anything else in Europe at the time, which is why you still have, uh, even through like the, uh, the days of Beethoven, people trying to pull away from the nobility. But you have early examples of it here. So let's talk a little bit about Popea because it's a fascinating opera. Uh, this is one of the first operas I saw with Oliver Camacho back oh, in the day. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure he'll be correcting me even more about it as I talk <laughs> about it. Uh, it premiered in 1643. 
Uh, and it is, because it's Monteverdi's last opera, it differs considerably from a lot of his previous work. There is, in fact, a lot of debate over whether certain parts of the opera are actually written by Monteverdi. A lot of scholars think it was a collaborative effort where Monteverdi was overseeing a lot of younger composers. They think that because of the way certain time signatures are written, uh, certain styles, certain parts where if you're listening to it, it's like, this doesn't quite sound like the rest of the opera. But it's a whole debate. I'll but talk a little bit about it. But it probably was common practice at this yeah, point. It's like, exactly. we got to get a show on. We need one more piece here. Here, you compose that, you know? Exactly. And there was there's something to uh, to uh, the idea of Monteverdi at this point in his career is such like the old master of opera. Like, he's teaching with everything he does. He's, he's, he's breaking the mold. And he's encouraging these upstart kids to break the mold with him. So I he's think as much a, of a brand as he is a, a content <laughs> creator. Much like Disney on Ice, Monty Verdi is a brand. Uh, so uh, obviously, if you know anything about history, Popea was a real person. Uh, she uh, eventually got uh, married to uh, Emperor Nero, who uh, also a real person, who infamously was one of the worst people in history. Uh, even if you d discount a lot of the uh, Christian propaganda at the time, he was pr still pretty darn nasty, murdering people left and right, lots of backstabbing. Including uh, his own mother. Yeah, he, he, yeah. yeah his, especially. And his own, his own child. So. Uh -huh. And his teacher, and eventually Popeye, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, I mean, there are so many parallels to a recent autocrat that was in power <laughs> very, very recently <laughs> in terms of yeah. being loyal only to himself. Exactly. And satisfying his whims and having people in his ear that were very easy to influence. He was very easy to influence as long as they kissed his butt, as long as they flattered him. He's like, oh, yeah, that seems like a good idea. <laughs> and the instant he changes his mind, you're dead, you know, usually. Yeah. Uh, and this opera does a great job of really emphasizing sort of like the childish petulance of Nero as he goes along just demanding what he wants. Uh, backstabbing, having these like, you know, uh, shifts of mercy, which instantly go back to being like, oh, wish I hadn't spared that guy. You know what I mean? And the other, <laughs> and the other way around, he's completely like unhinged is very much the vibe they're going for. Now, this is kind of, you know, normal for an opera about, you know, uh, the Roman Empire. Um, but I will emphasize that this is setting a lot of precedents for not just operas in the historical context, not just operas about uh, ancient Rome specifically, but in any sort of political uh, opera. You have a lot of intrigue. You have a lot of backstabbing. You have um, a really large emphasis on the personalities of the leaders involved uh, and a lot of, you know, uh, uh, sort of h historical tweaking to make sure that they come across historical -ish. as theater. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're not being very accurate with the portrayals here, but you are getting the general vibe um, without losing the uh, the sense of a character moving from one moment to the other, which is what makes it so engaging and so interesting even today, so many uh, hundreds of years later. Um, now, the interesting thing, uh, because I think we'll be talking about some more operas that really play on a lot of the political backstabbing and precedents that I'm talking about here, I don't want to dwell on those too much for this opera. What I want to dwell on for this opera is the final duet, which is very, very interesting, the Portimiro. Um, basically, what happens is Nero and Popea go through backstabbing, killing, exiling, um, all of these other morally gray figures. No one's a good person in this opera, really. Um, but at the very end, these the two worst people in the entire opera, like the worst people you've ever seen, get everything they want. And they stand there and sing this beautiful love duet to each other, this Portimiro, which may, may not have been written by Monteverdi, again, which honestly makes it even more intriguing to me that there's this moment of... Just pure like we did it, we did it, baby. We we got married. We we've gotten everything we wanted. Everyone. I mean, did, did Britney Spears dead. write all of her songs? I... <laughs> <laughs> um, make, make it more relatable. But it has audience, these so. beautiful like close dissonant harmonies, not in like a a jarring way. Um, it's very much. Uh, it has this beautiful descending continuo line, very simple, very clear very unambiguous. It's almost like watching 
uh, propaganda for someone you've never for for a ruler you've never seen before after the entire opera was basically showing you how in no uncertain terms how terrible these people were. And it really works in a dramatically shocking way, even though the music itself is beautiful. Uh, and it really ha it really sets up this extraordinary dissonance between what the music is telling you and what the uh, and what the story is telling you. And it's also giving you insight into how contemporary audiences might have interpreted it, how they might have rejected it. Uh, it's just a fascinating final a cap where the two worst people you've ever seen get everything they want. Good call. Bad call on Opera Box Score. All right, let us wrap up this show this week. Wow, this is an exhausting show. Good call, bad call. It's how we finish every show, whatever the weather. Oliver Camacho. Well, just since we didn't have a two-minute drill today, I did want to congratulate uh, Megan Moore, Eric Faring, Blake Denson, and Eric Grendahl, and Timothy Murray, uh, who were the George London Foundation competition winners, each of them taking home 10,000 large. And la la. I know, congratulations. Um, and I'm actually disappointed in the George London Foundation for not making Cody Bowers, the countertenor, one of this year's winners. Uh, Cody Bowers, that's a name you will hear in the future. He is incredible. I told him he was going to win. He didn't. So I have, I have egg on my face right now. Uh, but he will win. He, wow, that is a he rare admission from he all of He will win. He will win. <laughs> Weston Williams. Um, well, going back to uh, um, the current situation in Eastern Europe, uh, I do want to highlight uh, two singers, Elena Garancha and Piotr Bachala who have both canceled all of their upcoming uh, concerts in Russia. Uh, and they both posted uh, statements uh, uh, against the war. Uh, and uh, Alina Garancha is bas basically called it, you know, a, a, a criminal sort of a war and music uh, has to unite. And what, what would the world be, as she says, without cultural exchanges between each other? Um, and uh, Pyotr Bachala, Unlike a certain soprano we might have, might have talked about earlier uh, in a uh, statement on Instagram said, I am not a politician and I have no influence on political decisions, but I am an artist and I can use my voice to express my opposition to the war mm. that takes place just across the border of my beloved motherland. Uh, and I just think it's really uh, great to see artists standing up for what's right, using their political power for... Uh, their their image for political good. Uh, what a thought, you know, and I uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, give a shout out to Pyotr Bachala and good, good tone quality. And Russia has been sanctioned. You're not going to get those beautiful <laughs> tenor and mezzo soprano notes. Sorry about it. <laughs> Ashley Hardgrave. Uh, congratulations to friend of the show, Janai Breger, and hopefully soon to be friend of the show, Isaac Savage, for stepping in mm -hmm. at the last minute as soloist for uh, the Beethoven Ninth Symphony with Chicago Symphony Orchestra this weekend. Uh, it was a really emotional series of concerts. Uh, Jennifer Johnson Cano was the mezzo, Tarek Nazmi was the bass, all delightful, and there was really something different about singing about brotherhood and unity on Thursday of last week. Yeah, there was one particularly beautiful voice in the choir, sort of in the, in the in that mezzo soprano range, just kind of you know some. I don't know. I, I couldn't put my finger on it. But it was one person in particular. Uh, sounded fully, amazing. Fully sobbing. That was me. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> I watched uh, Joel Cohn's film, The Tragedy of Macbeth, which is with Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. It's shot entirely in black and white. It is utterly brilliant the entire design looks like an adolf appia set and for all you scenic designer nerds out there you know what i'm talking about adolf appia the way is that, that this is that thing a drinking cue lit, you could drink on that there you go. it is so gorgeously lit it's beautifully acted it's less than two hours and it's some of the most conversational intelligible shakespeare i think i've ever heard that's it for this week's edition of America's Talk radio show about opera. Our announcer, he's Norm Waddell at normwaddell.com. Again, if you're watching on TDO, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Get that full show. Stitcher and Spotify, you click follow on Apple Podcasts. You just hit the plus sign. 
Send us a voice memo. Email us your hot takes, operaboxscore at gmail.com. You're going to get an OBS beer coaster and an OBS lapel pin. A couple folks wrote in last week. I need to get them their merch. Our creative consultant is Oliver Camacho. Our audio and video editor is Weston Williams. For your co-hosts, Matt Cummings and Ashley Hardgrave, I'm George Cedarquist asking you to continue the conversation about operas. You come down from your fat Tuesday punchy sugar high. We're back with an all new show next week when we take a deep dive into the Metropolitan Opera's just announced 22-23 season. Plus you get more opera headlines, more hot takes, and more solidarity with Ukraine. Join us. Thank you.